All right, so before we start the Java, I'm just going to give you a bit of a context. My name's James Gray. Um, well, yeah, who are we and where are we from? Well, as I said, my name's James Gray. Um, oh, I've gone too far. And David Edwards is here. He's actually been doing the talk. I'm one of the uh, practice lead and architects for the MOJ, that's Ministry of Justice. And uh, we're working on a project called the Common Platform. Well, I call it a program because it's a little bigger than a project. Um, Common Platform, it's a collaboration between Ministry of Justice, HMCTS, um, CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, and Public Defender Service. Um, it's actually, well, a few facts. It's actually um, the largest digital transformation program in government at the moment. Uh, it's the far, first real example of joined up government. It was a couple of prime ministers ago coined that one, but this one's a real first attempt to do this. Um, transforming a 300 year old paper system. So from arrest to prison, police to prison. Um, and basically it's a once in a generation project. So it's a really big deal for everybody involved. Um, some of the challenges, obviously the scope, you can imagine person gets arrested. What happens? Evidence, everything. Lawyers involved. Um, audit trail of every little bit. So that kind of gives you a bit of a context of the problem. And really, where do we start with the back end? Well, a microservices architecture was kind of the chosen path. Uh, we tried a few different things, and this is where we're at at the moment. So on that note, I'm really just going to hand it straight over to David, who is one of the lead devs in what we call TechBot, which are kind of uh, doing this. The code is available online. Also, we are recruiting as well as Brand Code, uh, Brand Watch. Um, come and see me afterwards, or grab an email address if you're interested. Um, part of this common platform is actually the the first part before another bigger project called Reform that's coming online. It's the same deal, um, and they are recruiting heavily at the moment. But so are we. So, um, as I say, come and say hello afterwards. All right, I shall hand over to David. Okay, thank you very much, James. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, here's my uh, running order for tonight, just so you know what we're gonna cover off in this uh, presentation. So first of all, I'll address the, uh, the burning question I'm sure you all have, which is uh, why on earth have I called this presentation the myth of fingerprints? Uh, then I'm going to uh, cover off a few uh, um, concepts that I think are uh, uh, central and crucial to understanding why we've taken this particular architectural direction. And then um, we're going to go over uh, considering the uniqueness of microservices or spoiler alerts, uh, why maybe they aren't so unique after all. Uh, then go over a few of the highlights or sort of technical highlights of uh, interesting points of, uh, of how we've uh, solved some of our problems. And then uh, finally do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, you'll note that I've uh, annotated a couple of the points on the agenda um, with at Java, that's to indicate when the, uh, when the code's coming up. So if you're only here for the code, then you can snooze until we get to that point. Uh, if you're not interested in the code at all, then uh, that's when you can pretend that your mobile phone is buzzing in your pocket and you can start reading the important emails. So first off, explain the presentation. Uh, so All Around the World, or A Myth of Fingerprints, is a song by Paul Simon, where he uh, theorizes that despite the fact that uh, as humans we all have fingerprints that make us unique, uh, in actual fact, we're all the same inside. Um, I'd like to say that that's a rallying call uh, against discrimination and uh, fantastic, but actually I think he's saying that we're all the same in a bad way and that that's why we can't have nice things and that's why we can't get along. Um, but that's not what the presentation's about. Um, what it is about is uniqueness. So, a few concepts. These are a few of the building blocks uh, that we're basing our architectural approach on. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you will be familiar with, um, with at least some of them. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on them all. Um, I'm just gonna pick out a few points about them that I think are interesting and that are particularly relevant to how we're doing things. So we've got domain-driven design, uh, microservices, um, uh, CQRS, and uh, event sourcing. 
So first, all, first off, um, uh, domain-driven design. So domain-driven design gives us a, a, few, a few useful uh, uh, tools in our, uh, in our tool belt. Um, it helps us to, uh, to talk to the business and understand our domain. Uh, it helps us to talk consistently about it in the same language as them. Uh, and it also allows us to split up our domain into, uh, into manageable parts, which is particularly important for us because a big program, uh, lots of different ways in which the system needs to be used, um, and we need to be able to split them up so that we can work on them sensibly. Uh, we, we're talking both about the problem space here, but also about how we apply this to the, uh, to the solution space as well. Uh, and part of that is how we split up our solution space into bounded contexts and how we uh, uh, implement those uh, as logical services. And those logical services, that's where we translate into the physical. Uh, that's where we are building microservices to, uh, to implement those, uh, those logical ones. Then CQRS and event sourcing, um, they're commonly bundled together as a, uh, as a concept together, but in actual fact they're separate. Um, but when combined, they give us uh, three interesting ways of uh, modeling the way that we implement our system, um, particularly pertaining to how we manage changing state on the system and, and so on and so forth. So those, those, those three things are commands, which are the way in which we can tell our system um, that we want to change the state of it. Uh, commands can give rise to events that are, in actual fact, facts. Um, they are uh, a record of state changes that have happened. Uh, and then finally, queries that we use in order to determine what the current state of the system is. And then the fourth point on this slide uh, is back from domain-driven design, and it's the concept of aggregates. Um, and th this is quite a, uh, an involved um, uh, point, but um, if I drill it down to, to what is relevant to this particular presentation, aggregates uh, we're using as a way of bundling up our business logic uh, into components uh, so that we can apply that business logic to decide whether or not we should change the state of something based on uh, receiving a command. So, First proper hint of microservices here in this presentation. So I expect you've seen slides or lists like this before. Uh, what are the benefits of doing microservices? Well, they're all pretty obvious. We're all familiar with um, how great they are and uh, how much benefit we can get out of them uh, and using them in our architecture. Um, and I'm not going to cover any of those at all, in fact. Um, what I'm actually going to do is uh, pick out one particular one that's hiding away in there that, where I want to focus on the hidden risk behind it. And that is technical diversity. So what do I mean by technical diversity? Well, this is an idea going back to, uh, to the whole service-oriented architecture concept in that we can, uh, we can publish a contract um, and taking this back to my half-baked analogy of fingerprints, our contract of our microservice is like a fingerprint. Um, and that allows us to hide the implementation of that service behind that contract. And that means that we can implement it in whatever technology we want. Um, we can change how it's implemented. And so long as we keep on uh, uh, implementing the same contract, providing the same contract, then uh, nobody who's consuming our service matters. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, uh, if you let a .NET developer onto the team, then, uh, you know, they can go wild and uh, do what they want. And so long as they don't break the contract, then uh, um, everyone's happy. But actually, sometimes that might be a bad thing. And in our particular case, it, um, it can be a, a really bad thing. You know, we're a, a fairly greenfield project. Um, we've got multiple... Uh, development teams, all working from a standing start, uh, so um, uh, inventing things as they go along. Um, and uh, because of the way that we're approaching uh, domain-driven development, a lot of our services, our microservices, are in actual fact, essentially technically speaking, doing the same thing. The main difference between them is actually uh, the business logic that they are wrapping up. And of course, 
if you've got lots of development teams who are all trying to solve the same problem at the same time, uh, they're bound to solve it in slightly different ways. And that means that uh, we can't benefit from reuse as much as we might be able to because it's quite hard to reuse code that hasn't quite been written yet. Um, and it's also a massive uh, efficiency issue because you know, if you switch from working on one piece of the system to another and the same uh, same thing is essentially implemented in two different ways, then you've got to do a lot of context switching, figuring out where things are, even down to how projects are structured, you know, how, what your file structure is for where and package structures, things like that are massively reduced developer efficiency if you can't figure out where things are. Um, so it's a, that's a, that would be a big drain if we uh, did things differently all over the place. And also, we're a large, um, a very large public sector project, so we also have very specific governance requirements, um, such as, uh, um, for example, uh, technology choices. You know, all of our technology choices have to uh, have to go through an approval process uh, and have to be discussed and. Uh, and, uh, and agree that they're the right decisions to make. So uh, that .NET developer who re rewrote that service back then, yeah, he's in big trouble. But also we have uh, cross-cutting concerns as well. So uh, yeah, we have things like um, uh, security to think about. Yeah, we have to make sure that we can prove that the system that we've written adheres to certain security policies. Yeah, how do we achieve that if all of our systems are written uh, in dramatically different ways? Uh, auditing, you know, we also have to be able to prove that the system can record audit logs of, uh, of what, what's, what it's been doing. And again, if we have to implement all of those requirements uh, in slightly different ways to, uh, to, to apply to different parts of the system, that's very inefficient and uh, very hard for us to prove that we've actually achieved those, uh, those, those, those standards and those, and those requirements. So let's just take a step back a second and think about writing uh, a microservice. So typically you might make a technology choice first. You might think, oh yeah, actually I quite like Spring Boot. I'm going to write a Spring Boot based microservice. It's really fast. I like it. And everyone else agrees. Great. So then if you're doing things sensibly, you might decide to design your contract next. You might decide, oh, well, actually, I need to tell people who are going to be consuming my service what it looks like and how it's going to interact with the outside world because uh, um, you know, other people need to interact with it. The UI guys need to write their code and they need to get on with it, so they need a contract to, uh, to see how it's going to work. So where do you, where do you go next? Well, whichever framework you've chosen, whether it's Drop Wizard, Spring, or uh, you're doing it in JE, uh, or writing some JAX-RS. Generally speaking, what you'll end up doing next is uh, writing some, some controllers or some uh, 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 resources, putting some annotations all over them. And then if you want some brownie points, then you make sure that you put all of your business logic into some reusable components and services uh, that you can then inject into those controllers uh, and uh, uh, pass the buck over to them so that you've separated the, uh, the responsibilities and concerns from your controllers and your, uh, and your services. So, great. But what if you wanted your microservice to consume uh, messages from a topic or a, or a queue instead? Well, fine, you know, uh, choose your framework again, Spring or JE, whatever it is. Um, implement some, uh, some, some, some beans, uh, some listeners that have some annotations on them perhaps. And then again, you, you delegate your, uh, your business logic to your, uh, to your components, your, um, your services and components. Well, we have those sorts of requirements. Um, but in fact, we have... Uh, quite disparate requirements for various bits of the system. So we have an Angular JS UI um, that needs to be able to, uh, to query our microservices and uh, send commands to them. Um, but also our services need to interact with each other. They need to be able to listen to events that have been raised by other services. They need to send commands to other services and uh, so on and so forth. So we, need, we know right from the very start that um, we're going to have to support a few of these different ways of, uh, of talking to each other. 
Um, we need to support commands being sent by HTTP. Uh, we need to support events being uh, being sent by, uh, by by queues and queries by uh, by HTTP. And some of these are synchronous. Some of these are asynchronous. Um, but we also know that because of the scale of the uh, of the program, um, that these requirements are going to increase over time, and that. Uh, this is certainly not the limit of the ways in which we will need to interact with the services that we're building. So we need to build for flexibility as well. So what is the difference between talking to a microservice using a message queue or talking to a microservice uh, using a REST API? Well, actually, there's not really very much difference at all. I mean, we often think about uh, REST as being synchronous because the HTTP protocol returns a response. Um, and we often think about messaging as being asynchronous because typically when we see it, we're consuming stuff off a queue or, or whatever. Um, but in actual fact, they can both be used for either of those models. Um, there's not really a difference. Uh, so why earlier um, were, we, uh, were we talking about implementing our REST service or our um, messaging service in different ways. Well, what if both of them looked the same? This approach is sometimes referred to as the hexagonal architecture. And here's my little diagram of the hexagonal architecture as we see it. You'll see it's uh, a bit of a irregular hexagon, um, and it doesn't have six sides. Um, but it does have uh, all the other things it needs, I think. So sometimes the hexagonal architecture is referred to the uh, to the ports and adapters architecture as well, and then it starts to make a little bit more sense. So this is roughly how we want to build a service. We want to be able to say, uh, our service can receive commands or queries or events, and uh, that might be by REST or it might be by messaging, it might be by carrier pigeon, who knows. Uh, and we want it to go through something that we call an adapter. And then the adapter will turn that message, however it came in, into some consistent internal representation of a message. And then we can start treating things uh, consistently however they came into the system uh, because we can now create uh, a dispatcher um, and that dispatcher can have handlers registered with it and then the dispatcher can figure out based on the message that came in regardless of where it came from which handler should then handle that particular message and then those handlers, well, they need to do something with the message. Those are the, uh, those are, that's the place where you know, a developer is going to write some, uh, some, some business logic or some, something specific to do with that, with that message. So they need to be able to use other services, other components uh, that, the, that, that are available in the system. So we can inject those. Um, so we can make uh, services available to those handlers and inject whatever we want into them. And those services might be things that we provide as framework components. Uh, or they might be things that the developers written themselves specifically to support that handler. They might be services that talk to other services remotely, or they might be services or components that, that talk to the database. It doesn't matter. We can treat them all the same. So here's an example. So in our framework, uh, we uh, have an example application, an example domain that we use for testing out how our framework components are working together so that we can write integration tests and, uh, and test the framework as we're going along. And our example domain is a cake shop. So one of the commands in our cake shop domain is that we need to be able to add a recipe to the system. And uh, here's what this example is showing. So some external service or a UI says we need to, uh, to, to add a recipe to the system. So it issues an add recipe command and it does so through a REST interface. So that REST interface is provided by a REST adapter and then it, that converts the message into our standard internal format, passes it onto the dispatcher and the dispatcher says, hey, 
the add recipe command needs to go to the add recipe command handler. So let's deal with that. Now this is this particular example is handling a command. This is uh, doing a bit of our CQRS and event sourcing. Um, so what that uh, recipe add recipe command handler needs to do is figure out whether or not this command can be applied. And if it can, then it needs to, uh, to, to raise some events and those events need to be stored and published so that other people know that they happened. So it needs uh, a couple of components injected here. One is an event source, which will give it an event stream, a you know, stream of events for that, uh, for that particular um, aggregate that we are um, uh, uh, applying to. Uh, and then we need to actually replay those events that we got out of the event store to rehydrate the aggregate to get back to the state that it was in uh, after the last time we did something to it. So we have an aggregate service that's responsible for that, that looks at the event stream and looks at the, uh, the aggregate and uh, reapplies the events and gets back to where it was. Then the command handler can say, okay, now I'm ready to apply my command. I'll see if I'm allowed to apply my command. So it calls a method on the uh, recipe aggregate to see whether it's okay. And if that's okay, then it will issue an event, which goes back onto the event stream, gets appended to the event stream, which then stores it, goes back into the event source, stores it in the database and publishes it onto a message queue. So there's quite a lot going on there. And we've hit our first code, yay. So this is our add recipe command handler. And it actually boils down to quite a simple bit of code, really. It does exactly what I just said. It, um, uh, it handles a certain type of command. When it's got that command, it then goes to the event source, which is injected. Uh, and gets an event stream from it. Then it uses the aggregate service to create a recipe object, which is our aggregate, based on that stream of events. Then it calls a business method on the aggregate, on the recipe object, uh, to try and add that recipe. And that will then give us back uh, a, a list of events that that, that resulted in. And then finally, we append that stream of events onto the original stream, and that will automatically then store those additional events in the event store and uh, publish them onto a queue for any listeners. One thing to note is that um, we've got our uh, services that are injected using uh, a, a J standard at inject annotation. We've also got another annotation there at handles. That's one of our own, and that's what we use to indicate that a particular uh, method is a handler method. And that takes a string that indicates what sort of message this particular handler can handle. And we'll see that again in a minute. So next, this is uh, a rough layout of what our uh, recipe aggregate looks like. And there are, there are various ways of implementing aggregates for, uh, for, for this pattern. Um, but the one that we've chosen looks roughly like this. There are two methods there. Um, the top one, add recipe, is a specific one that is for um, uh, applying that particular business action onto the, uh, on, onto the, uh, to the aggregate. And the one at the bottom uh, is one for uh, applying a state change and it's important that we keep those separate because um, when we rehydrate an aggregate house using an event stream, we want to be able to replay the events that were already stored uh, without doing all of our business logic checks because those events have already happened, so they have to happen again when we, uh, when we figure out what the, uh, what the current state of this aggregate is. So we split that out into, the, into that bottom apply method and the top one, uh, is simply uh, applying the business logic that needs to happen to decide whether or not that particular uh, action should actually happen or not. So if, if there was some, some business rule that meant that it shouldn't be applied because of the current state of the, uh, of the recipe, then uh, that would fail at that stage and throw an exception or something. 
uh, but if it succeeds, then we want to return uh, one or more events that, um, that indicate that this, this succeeded. Uh, so that's what we're doing in the last line of that add recipe method. We're creating a new recipe added event and we're applying it to ourselves so that we update our own state and then we're returning it as a stream so that we can be appended to the, uh, to the event stream by the command handler. So that's the internals of the command handler and the aggregate, but we haven't touched on how a command actually gets that far. So we said earlier that we wanted this to be a REST interface. Um, we are describing our REST interfaces using uh, RAML, which is just a simple uh, YAML-based uh, um, specification for describing your REST interfaces. It's pretty simple. Um, you can see at the top you've got a base URI that specifies the, um, the, the, uh, the, the start of the URI for the service. And then we have a, an endpoint, specific endpoint slash recipes slash recipe ID, which is the one that will receive our command. Under that, you can see that we are posting the command to that endpoint and that the body of that post uh, has to adhere to a certain JSON schema for an add recipe command. But also you can see that we're specifying the media type of that post. And that's a custom media type. It's actually saying that it's an application slash JSON uh, payload that we're posting but that we additionally have this vnd.cakeshop.command add recipe uh, string in there that indicates the type of JSON payload that we're sending. And that's critical for the way that our system is working because that's what means that we can tie this particular uh, post to a particular command handler. So what does the REST adapter look like? Because we need to be able to, uh, to consume messages off, that, input, off, off that, uh, that REST endpoint and pass them on to our dispatcher so that they can be handled. Well, it would look something like this. Um, we're using a bit of JAX-RS in here. So you can see at the top, we've got our path annotation that specifies what endpoint we're, uh, we're, we're, um, we're, we're attached to. And at the bottom, you can see our method that actually receives the command, which takes a post and it consumes the media type that we saw in the, uh, in the RAML definition on the previous slide. And then you can see we've got a few framework components that we're injecting, like the REST processor, and um, we're injecting the headers from the, uh, from the JAXRS context. Uh, and also we're injecting this, uh, this dispatcher that we're going to use for passing the message on. And then the body of the method at the bottom is basically taking the uh, uh, parameters and the payload that we've received, wrapping them up uh, and passing them on to this REST processor that then passes them on to the dispatcher. It probably looks a bit unintelligible from that distance, but um, it's as simple as we could make it, but it's still pretty complicated. And that's, uh, that's good news really, because you don't have to write any of that, because we can generate all of that from the information that was in our RAML file. So that's all for free. So what about messaging endpoints? Well, we needed a way of describing messaging endpoints as well, and we thought, well, if we're going to be treating them like our REST endpoints, why not describe them in a very similar way? So we came up with the idea of using RAML again for them. Um, but this is messaging RAML, so we're, we're calling it MAML. But the structure is very similar. Um, and in this case, you can see that our endpoint is actually uh, our queue name, because that's the queue that we're going to receive commands on uh, for our cake shop service. But otherwise, it's very similar. We're using the same uh, media type to describe which command it's going to take. And if we receive lots of different types of commands, then there'd be a whole list of those media types in that file. So how do we receive uh, commands via our message queue. 
Well, we need a message listener. And this is how we do it in the uh, JE world. Uh, we use a message driven being which has a few configuration uh, annotations that describe what queue it should uh, uh, listen to and uh, uh, all of that sort of stuff. We've got a message selector in there that specifies which messages it should take off the queue just in case we've got multiple consumers that consume different types of messages, that sort of stuff. And then again, similarly to the, to the REST uh, adapter that I just showed you, uh, we've got a few services that we inject and then uh, a big old method at the bottom there that handles the dispatching. It's a bit simpler than the REST one, uh, but um, I still don't like the look of all of those annotations at the top. Um, but that's fine, because I can generate this from our messaging grammar or mammal again. So we didn't have to write that after all. So another use case for our RAML is uh, we need some of our services to call remote services. And we could have used some JAXRS interfaces and uh, some, uh, some REST easy proxy clients to, uh, to do this, but um, we've already got this mechanism for dispatching and handling, and uh, we've already got all this RAML kicking around that describes our remote services. Um, do we want to do that? Don't know. But we thought, well, actually, we could describe a remote service and pretend that it's a handler, like we were handling our local messages before. So if we do that, then we can create a handler like this, which uh, takes, a, uh, takes a query or whatever it is that we're, we're calling on the uh, remote service, and we can pass it into, into some, <coughs> excuse me, um, pass it into some, uh, some component that we've written uh, that will then magically do a request against the correct endpoint on the, uh, on the correct service. Um, and again, we can generate all of those from the RAML of the service that we are calling. So another thing that we've seen through this is uh, how we handle commands, queries, and events. And I didn't mention that when we were looking through the code, but um, uh, you might have you might have noticed that all of our adapters and our um, our handlers were all dealing with envelopes. And our envelopes contain our metadata, and they contain the payload of our messages. And the payload of all of those messages is either a command, a query, or an event. So we have an internal representation for those. Um, we could have modeled them as just in JSON strings, we could have just taken the raw JSON that we were passed and just passed that around, thought about that. Um, we actually settled at the moment on uh, turning them into uh, to JSON objects, so we passed JSON objects around as the payload, so it's a sort of between stage, so you can still grab values out of fields and so on. Um, but we haven't gone quite as far as the last option here, which is to model them as POJOs. Um, and the reason why we did that is because in an awful lot of cases, we don't actually need a POJO to represent our payload. Uh, it's just unnecessary extra code that we have to write and test uh, because all we need is some data out of some fields and we don't want our code to be brittle and have to be updating lots of getters and setters and so on. Um, but there may be some cases in which we do want POJOs. And one of those might be when we're modeling our domain using our aggregates, we might want to have POJOs representing our events. Uh, so that we can have a nice, neat uh, definition of our domain model in our code with lots of class names and method names that actually describe the domain rather than being unintelligible to anybody except a Java developer. Um, so if we want POJOs, that's great, but um, I don't really want to write them. Um, and we actually have some JSON schemas because already because we need them to define our RAML. So, if we want POJOs, we can generate those as well. So I've talked about so far about the sort of things that developers have to write when they're implementing business stories. But behind the scenes, there's obviously a lot of framework components that knit all of this together. So I thought next we should uh, take a bit of a look at um, some of the interesting internals that we've uh, written so far. But first off, um, I've got a slide here that, um, that explains that actually all the way through here, I've been making it all sound really, really simple, but in actual fact, I've been lying. Um, and it's actually really, really complicated um, because 
each one of our microservices isn't just one instance of our uh, uh, hexagonal architecture, it's actually nine instances of the hexagonal architecture. So each of the boxes on here represents a component within one of our microservices. But each of those components uh, implements exactly the same pattern of receiving its uh, messages via an adapter, having injectable services, uh, and uh, um, uh, dispatches for being able to call out to remote services. Um, so why have we done it? Well, it's so that we can uh, define the responsibilities and the behaviors of all of these components separately. So these nine components, there is a, a, a reasoning behind them. Uh, the pillars roughly equate to uh, the concepts that we get from CQRS. So we've got the command pillar on the left-hand side, the event pillar in the middle, and the query pillar on the right-hand side. And then our, um, uh, our tiers there uh, relate to the, uh, to, roughly speaking, to the, to the layered architecture approach in that the, you know, the front is, is to deal with the, uh, with the interface, the middle is uh, doing controllery stuff, and the bottom is dealing with our view. Um, and then, so each of these components will have specific things that it's responsible for. So we can say, top left, we can say the, uh, the command API is responsible for schema validation. We can say that the um, uh, uh, command handler, bottom left, is the only one that's dealing with the, uh, with the event store uh, and uh, actually handling commands. Or we can say that the event listeners in the bottom middle in the query view are the only ones that are allowed to talk to the database. And we can also enforce behaviors of those if we need to. So we can, uh, we can enforce a particular behavior on a particular component if we want to be able to say, hey, developers mustn't be able to avoid doing a particular thing in a particular component. So what is our framework? Well, we're trying to make it as little of a framework as possible. We're trying to make it as a toolkit of components. So we've seen uh, generated adapters, uh, we've seen um, generated clients, we've seen uh, remote handlers for dispatching remote calls to remote services. Um, we've seen a couple of our injectable composable services uh, and all of those uh, the developer can essentially clip together in order to achieve what they need to in a particular part of the, uh, of the service that they're writing. I've pulled out a few of the interesting things that we've done in order to achieve that. Well, I, I think they're interesting anyway. Um, the first one is a Maven plugin for doing code generation. So what we wanted was to be able to take RAML files and uh, consume them and uh, generate code for various purposes. So we've seen the code it generates. Um, but obviously the code's different for different RAML files. So we need to be able to make our uh, Maven plugin pluggable. So we need to be able to say, for this bit, we want you to take this RAML file and use this particular code generator to, uh, to generate some code with. We've written generators in a few different ways. Um, we've uh, used code model library, we've used uh, um, text templates, and we've used uh, a library called Java Poet. Um, we've had some interesting experiences using all of those. A key point to note is that the code that we generate uh, is not intended to be edited by developers. So that's a key point. We don't want to have code that we generate that then you have to customize and then it's out of date and when you want to regenerate it that you can't because you need to pull across some changes that you made manually. So we very carefully structured things so that our generated code hands off to another framework component so that nobody ever has to touch it. And the benefit of doing that is that um, once we've comprehensively tested our generation process, we don't have to test any of that code again until we hit our integration tests and at which point it's tested implicitly as part of our integration tests. So generally speaking, day to day, developers don't have to test any of this. They just need to write unit tests for the handlers. So I've got a bit of CDI in here. Uh, I just pulled out a couple of points that I found quite interesting. Uh, personally, I come from a Spring background, so it was interesting to, uh, to, to see how things were in the, uh, in the other camp. 
So this is an example of how we managed to hook into uh, the CDI uh, system in order to be able to uh, do all of our uh, handler registration and, um, and all that sort of stuff. And this is using uh, uh, CDI's uh, event system. Uh, it raises events for all sorts of things in the life cycle of your application starting up and so on. Uh, and these are two examples of where we hook into that. So it has a, uh, a nice uh, uh, way of uh, just adding uh, an observables annotation to say what type of event you're interested in. And then you can do stuff uh, based on that happening. So in the top case, we're saying uh, whenever we see any class that's annotated with an event annotation, we can do something with it. In this case, we'll be uh, uh, adding it to a registry. And the bottom one is showing how uh, after uh, all of our beans have been initialized and the application has been fully deployed, then we'll go through and find all of the beans that are annotated with a service component annotation and we will uh, do something based on that. And in this case, what we do is actually raise some more events that we then listen for on one of our other components in order to, uh, to register those service components uh, with our dispatcher framework. Another thing I found quite useful and quite interesting was uh, the concept of injection points. So uh, JE doesn't have the concept, uh, a, sim a, a direct concept of uh, at configuration, which uh, a lot of you might have used in Spring. Um, instead, it has the concept of being able to identify methods as being producers of a certain bean type, uh, which is all well and good. But um, uh, what we wanted to do was uh, inject different beans into different uh, components, depending on criteria of that injection point. Uh, and you can't really do that with uh, qualifiers and that sort of thing, uh, because that requires you to have got the correct qualifiers on the, in the correct injection places. So instead, what you can do with CDI is you can say that your producer requires an injection point object, which describes the, uh, the, the object or the bean that you're injecting uh, into. So you can uh, look at that injection point, you can get information out of it. So in our case, we get the class uh, of that injection point and we check whether or not it has a particular annotation on it or not. And if it does, then we uh, inject a certain type of, in this case, a certain type of dispatcher into it. So, to wrap up and back to my um, analogy, I've talked a lot about uh, how all of our microservices are now implemented in exactly the same way um, and that we've got all of this framework uh, in order to make it really easy for developers to write their code. So what is unique about our uh, uh, microservices? Well, whenever we're developing a piece of uh, 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 business logic, implementing a business story, um, we'll always need to define our interfaces to our services using RAML. We'll always have to write some handlers, and those, as I've said before, those handlers are nice and neat, they're easily unit testable, and they're fairly agnostic of how the rest of the framework is, uh, is, is working, so we won't have to change them, hopefully, um, if we uh, make changes to the underlying framework. Uh, and also, obviously, we will need to write our aggregates uh, and the business logic in those, uh, which is a nice, pure, f completely unrelated to the framework uh, implementation of our business domain. But that doesn't sound like a lot. Um, and that's, there's actually still a lot for us to do on the program. Uh, because we're still in our infancy in terms of developing the framework. We've got the bare bones together so that we can start writing uh, handlers for certain cases, but we've got a lot of edge cases, a lot of complexity to deal with, a lot of integration. We've got to deal with workflow, uh, document storage, all of that sort of stuff we've got to integrate and, uh, and provide uh, support for in all of our services. We are producing our framework uh, in the open. We're coding in the open. Uh, and uh, what we've written so far is all available on GitHub if uh, people would like to go and see it. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, if people have questions, then uh, we can move on to that.
Cool. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Right. I'm going to start the front because it's easier there. If you speak nice so, and close into the uh, How do you deal with exception handling and fault tolerance, that kind of thing, with your many, many uh, kind of piece architecture? Um, so that's one of the uh, issues that we haven't fully designed into the framework yet. Uh, we're uh, focusing at the moment on the happy path. Um, but the general plan is that, uh, um, well, one approach that we may take anyway is that we will provide uh, a set of base exceptions for particular types of error condition. Um, and that uh, uh, if a particular handler needs to uh, to raise a particular error, then it will raise a, a subclass of that uh, of that exception, because there are different uh, scenarios for how we want to handle that exception based on what it actually means. And obviously, the framework doesn't know what it means, but um, the, uh, the the person writing the handler does. Um, yeah, there are some exceptions that mean that we might want a message to be retried because uh, it might be a temporary problem or it may be a, an exception that means that uh, um, this message, this command is never going to be applied and therefore we want to, uh, to, to bin it and nobody else should try and consume that message. So uh, um, there, are, there are different scenarios we need to deal with. Like I say, we haven't fleshed out the, the approach completely yet, but hopefully on the case. Okay, I've, I've actually got a couple of questions which Ooh. are all related. So I'll ask them all and then you can answer them at your leisure. Uh, one is roughly how many servers are we talking about for, for this system? Um, because obviously that changes how you scale. The second is what are you using to actually do the routing? Um, like what's your architecture for deciding what port number to connect to, you know, what, on what host? And the third one is, what did you do to look at um, the big players in this? Uh, I'm currently wearing a Facebook infrastructure t-shirt. I'm ex-Facebook. And obviously, Facebook have what is very much a microservices architecture right across their, their infrastructure. And they didn't use REST. They used something called Thrift. Why didn't you evaluate the stuff? Or what, what, what did you find was better about RAML versus Thrift or versus Protobuf? Um, especially given your question about the exception handling, which Thrift kind of does for you. So um, those, those are my three questions. Okay. Um, well, the last question, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dodge because I, I, I'm not going to answer that. Um, but Andrew, who's smiling at me there, might be able to answer that one in more detail because, I, yeah, I, I was not involved in the program when the decisions were made in, in that area. Um, <laughs> But I'll, 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 att I'll attempt a vague answer to the first two points, um, which probably won't satisfy you, but um, it'll be a vague answer while Andrew decides what he's going to say. Um, uh, so um, in terms of number of servers, um, uh, not sure at the moment, um, but the way that we're structuring the, the service, services that we're writing is fairly lightweight. So although I drew that complicated nine box thing, uh, in actual fact, you can run all of those components on the same, uh, in fact, you can, you can combine them all into the same war file and deploy them all together if you want to. Uh, so technically it's possible to, uh, to combine all of these things and run them in the same place if we need to. Uh, in terms of the number of uh, instances of those servers, uh, services, I think at the moment we've got about seven or eight contexts that we've, we, but that is, it's growing over time. Uh, in terms of how many servers we'll need, I don't know at this stage. Probably a fair few. When you said that, I, I, Uh, it, the the approach that we're taking is not specifically uh, chosen to uh, deal with high scalability. So although we've adopted the CQRS approach, that's not necessarily because we're expecting such massive volumes on our system that we couldn't have done it in a different way. Uh, there, are, there, there are other benefits to doing it the way that we, we've, we've chosen, uh, which is, which is more, more what we're about. Um, so we're not, we're not talking about Facebook scale here, certainly not. 
So service discovery has not been decided yet. At the moment, we're taking, uh, in fact, in the last week or so, we, we uh, took a stopgap decision, which was that we would just route all uh, requests via localhost and then uh, hope that our service discovery mechanism would uh, uh, have a way of routing that to the correct remote service if it needed to go remote. Um, but at some stage in the near future, we'll be making a decision on that, but we haven't yet. Yeah, there's lots to decide and lots, lots still to be done. Yeah. Um, I'll just answer the um, sort of service discovery one a little bit for a moment. I mean, that, that's likely to look something you know, along the lines of, you know, sort of console kind of world, something along those side of things, probably hooked into some of the deployment of topology tech. Um, in terms of things like thrift, you know, why not that rather than something like just JSON over HTTP? Um, pretty much simplicity for now. Um, yeah. So the exception side of things is perhaps slightly a red herring. So the exceptions are really internal to a service. So from the point of view of failure mode, sorry. They are, yeah, that, that's true. Um, but you know, from the point of view of distinguishing between either a system sort of error state, which is something which is potentially not recoverable from in a business meaningful sense, uh, most of the other things don't really result in an error directly from that, they result in a different type of event. So most of our sort of responses to things which don't do what we expect are much more about process compensation rather than they are about handling, you know, this went wrong, do something else with it. It's much more about, okay, right, well, you know, we tried to add a recipe, but the recipe failed because there was already one or you didn't have any eggs. Something else is listening for a, you know, not enough ingredients event and doing something else. So those still kind of basically fit into that same basic contractual approach. You're right. Most errors, if they are business errors, not technical ones, are part of a contract, which we can still do in that way. So. So uh, one of our remote viewers, HS, asks, uh, what DB are you using for storing the events? So at the moment, we're doing it really simply. We're just using Postgres, uh, just one big table in Postgres. Uh, cool. Another question from, uh, there's two questions. Let's go for which one's closest. Go, just lob the box. <laughs> Yeah, so it's sort of an extension of, oh, I have a loud voice, um, a, a mild extension of the other ones. Um, so one of the other benefits of using something like Thrift or, or Avro is that in terms of the message format, if you need to extend it later on, it does a lot for you in terms of preventing, uh, you know, backwards compatibility issues. And have you thought about that? And the other one was also, do you have any idea of an estimate when this is implemented, how many transactions or messages per second you'll be flowing around with the servers? Because I saw a lot of sort of JMS stuff in there, and we we kind of outgrew JMS here at Brownwatch, and we're Kafka based now. So I'm wondering if you if you know anything about that. I don't know. <laughs> you might want to pass it back to Andrew. <laughs> do you, do you want? Um, yeah, very simply. So I'll try and what the first one was in a second. In terms of message volumes, they're not enormously high. Um, we're only talking about hundreds a second, not thousands, really. You know, most of the things that we do are long running transactions and long running business processes. We're not too worried about, you know, flood scale at that point. Um, you know, the, the basic mechanic around that is simple, you know, sort of scalable AMQP or other you know, fairly simplistic tech because it doesn't at the moment need to be much more. Um, in terms of backwards compatibility around messaging, um, we've got a basic requirement that we're going to need to be able to grandfather stuff in anyway. Um, so we're going to take an approach very likely around messaging media types and versioning media types. So rather than actually saying this will be something which, you know, gets updated in this way, it'll be remaining in that way. And then it'll be a VX of a specific media type or a specific endpoint because we're going to need to support multiple generations of clients. We've probably got a 15 to 20 year timescale for supporting some level of backwards compatibility and a lot of the clients who won't control. So... Yeah, it was okay. 
What did I say about not catching it with your face? <laughs> Yeah, I've got two questions. The first question is, can you go into a little bit more detail on the event sourcing and the client? So uh, you've got an Angular JS UI uh, receiving events, say, from a JMS source. You're, you're not using REST HTTP there, surely? No, no, no. Um, so the Angular UI is only, at the moment, talking REST. So it is posting commands as REST uh, payloads in order to input into the system and doing queries as well by REST. So yeah. the AngularJS is not, is not doing any, uh, any JMS. So you do using any event-based, you're using Vertex, going to use Vertex? No, no, we're not. So, so the events come into play, um, if I go back a few. So um, in, this, uh, in this slide here, the AngularJS uh, application would be talking to the command API and the oh sorry I've walked off camera have I um, and the uh, and the query API yep uh, the events nominally are going down this sort of loop around here through to the event listener into a view store and then the uh, the data comes back up on that side of it um, but uh, there's a part of the system that we haven't written yet uh, which is around uh, asynchronous notifications. So uh, the Angular JS uh, uh, system is, is is writing asynchronously. So it's it's sending a command and it doesn't know whether the command succeeded or failed. So at the moment uh, we're still on happy path. So it just assumes that eventually that command gets processed and the data pops out the other end. Uh, but in the long term, um, or in the medium term actually, um, uh, we uh, we need a uh, uh, an asynchronous notification mechanism so that events get back into uh, the Angular JS application, and that will be done um, up through here and then back up to the uh, to the UI through uh, through either long polling or uh, or, or web sockets. Uh, I see. Okay. Uh, okay. So the second question follows on about from the question about the Facebook architecture. I use React heavily as well. Um, Facebook's technology stack has React, it has Flux, it has Relay, and it also has a, uh, and a very interesting technology called GraphQL. Um, part of the reasoning for using defining GraphQL was that you don't want your queries typed to the verbs of the HTTP protocol. Um, I, um, and there are a bunch of interesting Java app, uh, um, implementations of GraphQL going on. There's one which is tying into Spring, which might re replace query DSL and Spring data. And there's a, also an Antel R, uh, somebody's developed an Antel R grammar for, uh, for GraphQL so that you could write a tree walker, which does interesting things. I mean, I suppose the question is, why didn't you, why didn't you go, did you consider those, that approach? I, can I, I don't think we have the, the, the need for the complexity, the complexity. Uh, when I well, complexity. Uh, what what, say, what, what complexity? advantages do they give in terms of we we are, we we have a quite simple long but long transactions. We need an audit trail. That's about all we need. We don't have. I mean, we, as we said, we don't have massive queues of of messaging. In terms of no, doing, no, we, GraphQL doesn't imply you're necessarily using messaging. I mean, the point about this is that there's a off the shelf completely implemented uh, i mean react is way better than angular one okay but that's uh, okay. it depends it might be better it's not proven yet first of all i'm sorry it's not proven enough okay yeah so but, we, but, have, but we, have, we have we have we have we, well we have we have governing bodies so one thing in government you have to understand is that it's it's great you can pick up a technology it's proven by one, one, one corporation called Facebook. You, have, you need you, to get bleeding edge, and I would still react to still quite bleeding edge. It's a couple, what, it's a couple of years in, or a year in, um, compared to leading edge. It's a, a very difficult thing to get past uh, with, with, with lack of a buy, uh, with being extreme, lack of better of a phrase, old men on boards. So you, 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 have, a, you have a strong uh, inherent um, Reluctantness to pick up new technologies within government. 
So Angular, I, I, could, I, I had to fight tooth and nail up until three days ago to drop IEA support. You have the government digital service support. So without an IEA, I had no choice. I, didn't, I, I couldn't transcompile down. I couldn't even suggest React. So you're in my area here. So Angular was a good prom compromise. And the reason I chose Angular is because I can, it may be better than React, but we can use models where we can use React and Angular. We can use yeah. Angular just to, just to deal with, with, with parts of my system and I could use React in the middle. But the whole point is I, I have to get things past board. So the short answer is we have, we have to get them through technical design authorities. And it's something like React would be too much for them to swallow. I, the point I'd make is that the, the Re Re React text technology stack is actually very loosely coupled you exactly. don't actually you know you could just use graphql if you wanted to um, um, you know uh, it, it's just it's an interesting way of doing querying and and, and the whole approach to how it in, interfaces to to uh, data sources is very interesting as well I, I would i would agree with you but um i would i would hard to use that as an excuse or to use it yeah, I mean, I, that, oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I had to when I, when we did the when we did the stack, especially the front end stack was uh, Angular is a big step for government. It's a big step into single page applications. A big step, and we have to fight board after board after board to use it. That's where we are. You know, we we are talking stuffy government departments to get them to. I mean, we just managed to go from one point two nine in Angular to one point five last week. That's what I did in it. You know. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah no, no, I, I wish I could. Yeah, would yeah. Be, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have one more remote question from HS who says, uh, how do you guarantee that after storing events in Postgres, the event is published successfully? Uh, so we have a, uh, a transaction in the um, uh, event stream, sorry, the event source, uh, which covers both the uh, database and the, uh, the writing onto the message queue. Cool. Uh, I'm going to draw the questions to a close at the end. So one more round of applause for David for me. Okay, uh, I'll just call down my co-host James, who's going to go through the parish announcements for this evening. Um, good evening, everyone. Just um, three quick things to mention. So on the 30th of April through to the 1st of May, there's going to be a hackathon run by Sparks for Parks, which is a 24-hour web build and coding competition to encourage volunteering in Brighton parks and green spaces. <clears throat> um, and that, I'll put a um, link to that on the comments for today's event. There's going to be like a thousand pound prize for uh, the best thing produced, a number of hundred pound prizes, and um, yeah, full details are on their website. We've also got a um, raffle coming up. So if you're um, on the LG, LG, LJC group, you'll have seen these. It'll be an event where um, you sign up to the event and we pick one of those people because we have a free ticket going for DevOx UK, which is a conference coming up between the 8th and the 10th of June, featuring people like Trisha G and Josh Long. And there's also a 10% off code that we'll be publishing. And yeah, it does look like a fantastic lineup. Last thing to announce is that um, first Wednesday this month, we did a practical session, a coding dojo. Um, if you've never done one of these before, everyone basically sits together and takes turns working on the same problem. So everyone has five minutes each. It's kind of a fascinating thing to explore test room development, see other people's approaches, and to collaborate. We're going to be doing another one of those on the um, first Wednesday of May, which I think is the second. Um, but I'll announce that then. And if you've got any questions about that, come and ask me. And hopefully, um, I'll see some of you there. Thanks very much. Wonderful. And uh, thank you, James. Uh, last thing for me to say is please remember the building is alarmed. So uh, members of Brown Watch staff will escort you out so we don't end up tripping the alarm. I think we're going to decamp. Now, I've heard good things about the Black Horse next door to Pompoco as being a good venue for a an after after meetup so uh, we're going to decamp there afterwards for a few extra drinks so uh my final thank you to our speakers tonight and uh, i hope to see you at next month's event thank you very much